them Hellcat Huskers did their thing yesterday, man. What are your thoughts? Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. And I got on shorts. I got on shorts. <laughs> so, I got you on full, shorts. So, so you full-blooded Nebraska. Anything anything <laughs> over I'm 45? Ain't going to happen, Cap. No. But I am. I, this weather, I can do this weather. Okay. No, as I long as the wind, the wind is down, so you're going the There you go. There you go. Now about them Huskers. Bruh, that's three in a row. Yeah. Three games in a row where they brought it. I mean, brought it from first tip to the clock struck zero. They they battled, they fought, got it to overtime. And I tell you what, it was a little shaky in overtime, but huge gamble and huge steal by the head coach's son to, to seal the deal. Yeah, man, just talk about, I mean, obviously, you know, the pressure that Sam's under being the head coach's son. Um, I've seen it. I saw him play in high school. I knew he could play at the Division One Power Five level just by watching him, and just the way he, I knew he could finish around the hoop against bigger kids. And he's been around basketball his whole life, so he, you know, he was exposed to different types of ways to score uh, than a lot of kids at his age in high school. So that's why I knew that he could be effective uh, playing. But obviously, he's the coach's kid. Just talk about the type of pressure that he's under or was under. I think he's obviously earned his stripes. But then also to see how uh, he's getting the fruits of his labor as well on the on the floor and how much that could mean to uh, you know Husker uh, basketball in the future. Yeah, as a head coach's son in any sport, it can be some kind of pressure. But I think he's handled it uh, very well. I think he 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 waited his turn, and when like you said, next man up, right? When your when your name is called, you got to be ready. And I think right. he's prepared himself for this situation. You can see him, you know, on the defensive side, of, on the defensive end, how he's, he sits his butt down. He takes it upon himself to try to stop the guy he's guarding. Right. And he's found a role, and, and he's just taking it. He's found his niche on the team, and, he, right. and he's doing really well. Yeah, you know, I think the one thing that people don't understand is he, he's built pretty solid, so he's able to go and finish through contact. But then also yes. what he does well is, you know, he's going to make his free throws. You know, he's going to be in the right, sp- right uh, space at the right time. But one of the biggest things I want to ask you about this, about the about the Nebraska defensively. So they're not a big shot blocking team. No. And they were kept talking about this. But they're a really, really big charge team. Talk about that type of mentality of being a charge taking team to protect the rim versus what everybody likes to do. Get the big block. Crowd goes goes crazy. But we know more times than not, you're going to get a foul call because you're not just going for the, the 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 Tim Duncan block block where you just tip it to yourself. They're trying to get the big block, which leads to a lot of flat fouls. But talk about the mentality that this team is taking on to take on and get these charges, which isn't something that any basketball player enjoys to do. But the whole team has gotten into it. Talk about what what that type of mentality uh, means to a team like Nebraska. Well, it starts with the head coach. When you when when you're the, you're in the defensive minded head coach, the team is going to take on his his identity. You know what I mean. So right. I think it starts day one. When when you figure out you're not going to be a shot blocking team, this is what we need to do. You get there, get your feet set, and take it. And now it takes a different person or a different kind of guy. Because <laughs> because Maryland Maryland has some big boys though. You, Man, right? they got yeah. some big boy. I mean, right. anybody you face in the Big Ten is going to have some big boys, but right. It takes a different or a special kind of guy to just step in front and take them knees to your chest right. or knees to your groin area and sit there and take it and be able to get up and, and keep going. So I think it starts with the head coach. The team has taken on his identity and they're doing well. Kenny, I want to ask you this though, because Fred Horberg is obviously before even he got to Nebraska has been known as an offensive coach. His offense, mm-hmm. you know, it's a kind of North Carolina secondary break. Obviously put a lot of guys in the, in the NBA very successful at Iowa State, even successful in Chicago, even though I don't think they gave him enough time. So it, it's portable. Came here, obviously was trying to infuse that type of offense in his first couple of years, then did a about face. Talk about from a coach's standpoint, right? Because, look, we've had offensive coaches here, right? Mike Riley, Scott Frost, where they felt like, okay, we just outscore you. And that's just the Cliff Notes version, right? You know, let's just be honest. Talk about what it takes for a coach to say, hey, we're in year four or five. This is what we've done. This is what I've always done and been successful. But in order for us to be successful in this year, 2022 and 2023, 
this is what we need to do. And I need everybody in here to buy in because this is the only way that we're going to, not the only way, but this is going to lead to our success this year. Talk about from a coach's standpoint, what you have to do individually as a coach, right? You know, cause you have to have some self talks with yourself, but then how you go about your business as well, because people are going to be looking for chinks or cracks in the, in the floor to say, okay, he's not really about this new life. But obviously Fred is really about that life because the whole team is bought in. Well, you you hit the nail on the head. I'm sure Fred went home, looked himself <laughs> in the mirror. Listen, he went home. Right. He looked himself in the mirror and like, this is the team I got. I'm going to have to adjust to them. I, they, I've tried to make them adjust to me for three years. It didn't work. This is the team I have. In order for us to be successful, I'm going to have to adjust to them. He did it. Now, and I'm sure he's not second guessing, second guessing right. himself. Because he, in order for him to be successful and for those guys to be successful, he had to take on the role of the players he has. He had to right. as a coach and as a leader. And you, you brought it up earlier, you know, in coaching changes, you know, philosophies, you know, you may have a different philosophy than, but you have to look at, what you're inheriting, right? Right. If you have a quarterback that can't throw the ball, that can't line up and drop back and throw the ball 30 times, 40 times a game, you have to do what's best for him, right? Right. Do what's best suited for him and his, his playing ability. So as a coach, you go home, look yourself in the mirror. This is what we have. This is how we got to get it done. Yeah, I want to ask you about that. It, it Would it be super hard to do that uh, in football? versus basketball because you know i think you know fred recruited to this so this is something mm -hmm. that he might have even been thinking even towards the end of last year you know because you just don't wake up after the season mm -hmm. and be like okay i'm gonna do you know the season ends monday tuesday i'm gonna be this something that maybe he was forecasting as he was you know getting winded down you know the season last year could this possibly be done in football maybe not as drastically but the way that you could possibly play call maybe your defensive scheme i mean the best that's ever done it is bill belichick where he changes week to week actually sometimes quarter to quarter half to half but could you change and add some things in or subtract some things to make sure you can hold your head above water like i like to say to have a successful season and build that foundation of winning and we will do whatever it takes to win because i think that's also a unique quality that you as a coach that you try to infuse in your players, right? Learning how to win, learning how to win either ugly or doing something else that you normally don't do in order to be successful. Because at the end of the day, all the sacrifices that you've done, all the changes are, you know, secondary when you're winning. Yeah. So you recruit players for your system, right? You recruit right. players for the style you want to play, whether it's basketball, football, whatever. Well, the style you want to, you want to play, you recruit guys for those systems. Once you get them on your on, on your on your roster or wherever you need them, now you see if they can learn it. Now you see if they can develop. And if right. they may there may be slow developers, they may be slow learners that need reps. Now, so you look back and you say, okay, this is how we want to do it. But these two, our main two guys, aren't able to grasp it. Let's do what's best suited for them. So that's why Fred took on the identity of the guys he had. Those right. guys, he may have recruited those guys for the system he wanted to run, but they couldn't pick it up. Right. Something led to the fact that, okay, we have to change. I have to change. Whether they couldn't pick it up, whether it was too difficult. And then Coach Samuel, who was a you know head coach I worked for for a long time, he always said, if they don't get it, if your best players don't get it, dumb it down, simplify it so they can play fast. Right. In any yeah, sport. Yeah, you see that. Yeah, people talk about Wade Phillips. You talk about, I saw Vic Fangio. I know uh, Jake is hyped because he signed his three-year deal today. I played in Vic's system. Uh, it can be complex, but I think what he learned by going to the Ravens and being actually a linebacker coach is simplicity. And then he took it to San Francisco, and now he's obviously thought of one of the best defensive coordinators in football. So I think it's portable. And you, and you saw it, yep. you know, obviously with Nebraska – uh, to be able to play defense and then obviously keep themselves in the game until their offense could get going. I want to ask you about the game. Uh, you know, I know you watched. Talk about when, you know, Greasel and Walker went out, the ability for the team to keep it close to they could, you know, rest or stay on the bench so they couldn't, you know, get the possibility of fouling out. Talk about that 
you know, from a coach's standpoint and I guess a fan standpoint, you know, what it really takes to get guys that go from like secondary or third, you know, roles to say, all right, now you have to break the press. Now you got to actually play a different position. Like Casey, right? He's usually an off the ball player when Greaseau and Walker is there, but when they're on the bench, now he's got to be able to break the press. Talk about that as well, how big that can obviously pay dividends in their, their ability to pull out a victory yesterday. Again, when they recruited him, I bet you he was, a, he was a guy they wanted to be on the ball. To fit their system, they moved him off the ball. Right. He's probably done it before he got to Nebraska to be sure. on the ball player. So they know and the team knows, hey, if so-and-so, so-and-so is not in the game, this is your role. You do right. this role the best of your ability. And they, they all, to me, they all just buckle down and they play team basketball and they bump and grind all the day long. Like, what do you call them? What do you call them? What do you call them? The Hellcat. They the Hellcat the Hellcat, the Hellcat Huskers brought it. Yeah. Brought it. They did not it, disappoint. It's all. It's almost like they get it to overtime. You know, they they when it's even, they leaving. So it, it, it's yeah. good. I think it's uh, the ability to hit big shots. I think Tominaga's bomb there at the beginning of the overtime yeah. really set the tone. Yeah. Uh, you know, I watched it on TV and you could see, you could feel the energy. You know, yeah. and you know, Kenny, we played in big games of football where the crowd is on point, the players are on point, the coaches are on point, the you know, the communication and connectivity is on point. It's just a matter of time before you know you pull out that victory. Talk about what it's like to be, I call it in that arena. You know, you know, I was big on looking at guys and feeling their energy in the in the in the uh in the locker room because that's how you know we are going to take the field talk about that how i'm sure they felt like when they stepped on the court they knew no matter what was happening we were going to keep plugging away and they were actually you know i felt like that game was a battle of wills right yep. nebraska had the first half it was an ugly first half but nebraska essentially you know made it ugly and was the pretty of the ugly ugly two teams offensively in this in the first half maryland came back maryland actually had control of the game you know what I'm saying? Their, their big guy got going. It was like who was going to, quote, unquote, bend the knee first. And Nebraska did not want to. It was almost like, I don't know if Kenny V saw that movie 300, where he faked like he was going to kneel to him, and then he stood up and threw his spear at him. That's essentially what Nebraska did. They faked like they were going to go down. Gotcha. Now we're in overtime. Now we didn't came away. Now we won the battle. We won the war, and, and you thought you won the battle. I tell you what, to go back to what your original statement, Husker Nation showed up. They fed off the, the, the crowd. Like you said, when we played, when you walked out on that field you and, that, and that, that Husker Nation started saying go Big Red, it got you pumped, especially for a big game, Colorado, Oklahoma. So looking back at uh, this past weekend, when that crowd was going, they got those guys going. And when he hit that three-point shot, you saw, you saw, you saw the drilling that that was going through that kid's you say, right. okay, he, he's ready. Right. There's nothing that this team can do, Maryland can do, that's going to be able to, to hold the Huskers back. And I re, I'm going to relate that to KU against uh, Baylor this weekend. <laughs> they were down 17, bro. Yeah. 17 at home. But didn't and blink, though. You don't didn't blink. blink. They did not blink. They did not panic. And you say one point, one possession at a time. Right. Man, they erased that They erased that deficit so fast. And one, they was up by 17. Right. So they, they fed off, just that quick. They fed off that home crowd, and that, and like you said, home home crowds can keep you in a game easily and get you back into a game. Yeah, we we got a question from the text line. I want to ask your opinion, Kenny. And it was more star power last year, but how is this team playing better? Uh, I think we know the answer, but you know we we're going to answer for the the text. Or what do you think? When you say more star power. Like, oh, well, well, I mean, look, man, you have Bryce McGowan's five star. Oh uh, yeah, Trey McGowan's. I mean, and then you had a lot of verge. So you had some more star power, some more, you know, and I think it's a different year. Yeah. Um, and I think if this I, I do think I will say this. If that team last year, even if you combine some of the, the pieces this year, or just that team last year, especially the way they played like the last quarter of the year, if they had another year, you would see some of the things that you're seeing right now. Because I do think those guys had star power, but I think they also realized towards the end of the season, because you saw them in the Big Ten tournament, saw them a couple games late. They they figured out, like, we have to play a certain way to be successful. They actually scored more points. 
They actually were a better looking basketball team. So I think the answer it is you got more players that fit a system, a defensive minded system, and offense is not I wouldn't say secondary, but the the offense is set up off the defense because you're able to stay in the games longer. Versus the, last year, I think it was a lot of offensive minded guys. But I will say this: the injury to Trey McGowan's last year hurt the team for the whole season because he's the guy that could that last year's team played like everybody else on the on this team yep. this yep. year and that and trey would have brought all those guys along and made them play defense like they're doing and he you know he, he got hurt he was out for so long so you know i think it's obviously people have you know a short memory and stuff like that and they played better at spurts but they didn't look as crisp i think they also adjusted offensively if you look at even the way that they spread the court. They have Walker on one side, Griso on one side. It allows Tamanaga to actually create some more one-on-one opportunities for either one. And when Gary was in, and then obviously Vandermel, you had, had good spacing. So it's different, but then also, excuse me, also Tamanaga has taken a step, or two or three steps to make this offense a lot better. So now you're seeing it. He learned last year, then he went back to the lab, and now you're seeing the fruits of his labor. What do you think? I think his movement off the ball has helped him a lot. He continues to move without the ball. So he's he's keeping that defender. That his The defender's eyes have to be on him. Right. So his, his ability to move without the basketball and them creating more shots for him in, in, in certain circumstances have really helped this team. But like you said, de- good defense leads to good offense. Right. So their, their, their offense starts on the defense end of the court. I want to ask you this. Is a good analogy for Tamanaga kind of like when I guess we had, you know, when Taylor Martinez was really rolling, you know, where the defense had to play 11 on 11. So it changed how you could play defense, right? Mm -hmm. If you got somebody or like, okay, here's Jalen Hurts. He makes you play defense differently than Tom Brady running the RPO because you have to have eyes on Jalen Hurts, right? So then that messes, messes up your run reads your play action reads and sometimes your coverage checks as well. Analogy to basketball. It changes the way that they actually can play zone or man, because if you give Tominaga a little bit of space, then he's going to hit you for the three. But what he also does is move without the ball, finish around the rim, kind of savvy. But what it does, it gives more space for Derek Walker and those guys to find the gaps in in zone or uh, man to man offense versus their defense. What I do like about a guy, his size, he can get buckets in the paint. For right. some reason, he can get buckets in the paint. He's so – I don't know if it's basketball IQ. Or is, he, is he studying his opponent? But he gets buckets in the paint. He causes havoc in the paint. To be to be that little, I'm like, this little dude. And let, now we got to stop calling him the Steph Curry now. We, we, oh, we yeah, gotta, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nebraska gotta, fans – hey, Nebraska fan or Nebraska media is, is quick to anoint somebody. They just, you, just go, you go from high school to Hall of Fame – you know, you compare it to Hall of Famers like that. But you know what I think he does is what people don't under like I think underestimate his time playing three on three yep. at an international level. None of this stuff is too big for him. Mm-hmm. When you're playing for your country, playing playing in the big in, this is this is this is exciting to him. But also what he is able to do, his movement without the basketball. The one thing that he does is no different than somebody has good handles. When you think of like Kyrie Irving, he changes the pace Mm -hmm. on how he's getting open. So you're never getting a good read on him. You know, it, Kenny, it's just like a defensive back. If you knew that somebody likes to shimmy inside out and then go deep, well, you got to read on him. But if he changes it up, then you're always on your heels. So I think Mm -hmm. what what he's done is he studied how to get open. The one thing I I think is maybe he got in the lab with Fred and they really broke it, broke down the offense and how he could be effective and how it could really pay dividends for Greasel, for Walker, for even Sam Hoiberg when he comes in, gives him some driving lanes when he wants to or open threes. And now they just got to hit him. So I think as the season continues to go, I think you're going to see him be more effective. Even if a team solely focuses on taking him out, he still finds a way to be effective. That's how it lets you, that lets me know that he's actually a scorer because he scored 20 some points but it didn't look like it. So it didn't have to be flashy. So he found different ways to get to the rim, different ways to get the the ball in the hole. 
but then you saw D Walker going off and Greasel. So you need once you get three guys going in basketball, you get three guys going. That's sixty percent of the guys out there starting. You in some trouble. That's why they call the Hellcat Huskers because it's no different if you're on the line and you got that VA Vortex and somebody comes up with that Hellcat. You lose that on O Street, man. You know, and I don't, I don't condone that stuff on O Street because people don't know how to drive. But the, those Hellcat Huskers is no joke, man. Three, three games in a row, uh, three phenomenal efforts. But I want to get you this. We got about a minute left. When you watch this team since they've been kind of inching towards playing like this, when the game gets tight, I feel like I'm more relaxed because you know what? I was like, I've seen these guys do this, and they, I see that they want to do it. What do you think? I feel the same way. They they haven't flinched. They haven't right. batted an eye. So, uh, again, it's a reflection of the coaching staff. I'm, I'm sure they make adjustments. Right. That you know, Fred has done a good job of making adjustments, in game adjustments, right. and the team has taken on that identity. So they have not flinched. The last three games has been great to watch. Let's see if they can continue it. Right, that's a big thing, man. De- dealing with success, they've done it, and yep. now that they're they're even, they're 500. Now you can see some of the things that are tangible, but we got to stay focused on the present day in the little things. And so it's going to be interesting to see how this team uh, takes steps to finish out the rest of the season. That's a good first segment. Kenny Will height, Jay Foreman, Austin on the ones and twos. Old school. We'll be right back. I'm on the mend. Kenny, you know what I'm saying? They try to get your boy, boy. Like, I mean, Kenny, man. Too much hey. birthday celebrating. Too much birthday No, that's what it, it wasn't enough. See, if I would have had, look, Kenny. If I would have had my hydroglyphics and my oh, Incredible God. Hawk, I'd be good. I was trying to be good. You talked me off the had... cliff. You're the I reason did. why. You're the reason why you. I'm over here with a little bit of sickness, man. We'll be back, old school. Jay Foreman, Kenny Wilhite.